Kia ora, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. I'm Francis Cook, Investments Editor for Business Desk, and today I'm joined by Mark Regal from Milford Asset Management. We're going to be talking everything you want to know about bonds and the debt market, but just before we get into it, here's some important information you need to know. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Welcome, Mark. Thank you for coming on. Now, a lot of people, they think investing, they think shares, investing into companies through shares, which, of course, love shares. But there's also the rather huge bonds and debt market. So what is that? How does it work? Well, hi, Francis. That's a great question. The debt bond market is huge um, and it does fly under the radar. People do think of shares when they first think about investing. So it's worth considering what's a bond and how does it compare to a share? So, well, when you buy a share, what you're buying is a slice of the company profits. You own that company when you own the shares. And so however well the company does over the next you know, 10, 15, 20 years, that will be accruing to you via, via the profits. When you buy a bond or you invest in a bond, that's not owning part of the company. That's lending the company money, right? So a company will issue bonds because it has a project that it needs to finance. Um, and so it will issue a bond for you know, a certain amount of, of dollars, $100 million you know, or even larger. Um, and then you can buy that bond and that's lending the money to the company, right? Mm-hmm. So whatever the company's profits do, it doesn't matter to the bondholder because at the end of the term of the bond, you'll get repaid your principal, how much you loan the company, and you'll also along the way um, earn some interest, what's called coupons, which is the bond yield that you'll get from lending that company money. I often think of it as you're acting like a credit card or a bank, right? You know, a lot of people have experienced that through getting that debt, but you might have a company or a government, right, who are saying, we want to do this project, we don't have the money for it, and so you get a whole bunch of people who will lend the money and you get paid back with interest, just like the credit card or bank would, right? Yeah, that's right. You, you're acting like the bank. Um, you're, you know, you're lending entities, and you, you know, you're right. It could be a government, it could be a company, it could be a local council. Um, lots of different entities need to raise money via bonds, and so you can choose which companies or you know, entities to, to lend to. Um, and you're basically using your capital, so your savings, to give them money so that they can then you know, invest in their projects, and then you'll get a kind of fixed rate of return. That's why it's called fixed income. Because you know the rate of return you're going to get when you buy that bond or you know lend that money to the company, you'll know the rate of return you're going to get if you hold that bond to maturity. Mm. Of course, when we talk about, you've, you've hinted at it beautifully there, the different debts you can do to different entities. And that changes what you're investing in, right? So you can get different types of bonds as an investor. Yeah, that's right. So again, let's compare and contrast to the share market. If you buy shares in Contact Energy, for example, that's just one class of shares. Whereas companies will tend to have lots of different types of bonds um, and they structure those bonds slightly differently. So you've got to be a bit careful about knowing what type of bond you're buying. The devil's in the detail a little bit. So that's why the bond market can be a bit more opaque to um, the everyday investor. Um, But different companies issue bonds with with different um, um, characteristics and then we, maybe we can cover some some of these in detail but generally speaking the key characteristics are the length of term of the bond so how long you're lending the company money for and it could be anything from you know very short term 30 days through to you know 10 15 20 years or in the case of government sometimes even longer up to 100 years um, and uh, so that's the key the, the, the key determinant and then the other bit is of course what's the rate of interest you're going to earn from lending the money to that entity for the period you know that the bond will be alive for you know until the, you know the bond matures and so you'll know that rate of interest that will be stated in the bond prospectus um, at the time of issuance yeah what are you looking for in that bond prospectus because you know we talk about you can lend companies money you can lend governments money and I imagine Venezuelan bonds might be quite different from New Zealand government bonds, right? Yeah, what are you yeah for? that's right. And so this is now the concept of credit, right? As in, if I mean, let's, let's kind of go back to that, you know, example where you're the bank. If you're lending to someone, you're going to want to know, are they likely to pay that money back or not, right? That's your key concern. Mm-hmm. 
if you're lending money to Venezuela, then you know perhaps they you know they, they might be um, you know some consideration that they wouldn't give you the money back. And same for companies. Some companies are more risky than other companies. If you're a you know um, a biotech company, for example, that might um, you know have a you know huge hit on their hands in terms of you know a drug that that gets passed and you know they can sell, um, but it might fail. Right? There is a chance, a good chance, that you might not get your money back for that type of investment. If it's Again, to take the example of Contact Energy, it's a very steady utility company that's got a stable cash stream that can then you know repay those bonds as they come due. So again, you know the credit worthiness is is different across those two. So you need to consider that who you're lending to when you're investing in bonds. Mm. So we often talk about the risk and return that you take a bit more risk, you hopefully get a bit more return. That's kind of how things work with money in general. So generally speaking. Where do bonds fit in the risk and return? And then what's what's the spread out there? How much can that differ between mm. different bonds? Well, so I think I think a key bit to consider is, you know, for the bond market, you don't normally invest in bonds by, you know, going to the company and, and, and buying the bonds or, you know, investing, l- lending the company directly. Bonds are traded on a secondary market, much like shares, right? So when you buy shares, you don't need the company to do an IPO. You can go to the market and you can buy those shares. It's the same with bonds. And and so after they've been issued with the interest rate that they're being offered, they will then change in price because these bonds trade every day, much like shares, and they go up and down, right? And there's different drivers for bonds than there are for shares, and we maybe can come on to those shortly. But in terms of the range of returns that you can get, the safer the entity you're lending to, typically the lower the level of interest that you're going to get on that. So government bonds are typically the safest ones and, and they will offer you the lowest level of interest. And then you can go into different types of, of bonds for corporates uh, and they can offer um, returns which are above and beyond what you would get on an equivalent government bond. Mm. And that spread, the extra amount that you can get can range from you know, nothing if you're Apple, for example, a very, very safe U.S. company is almost as safe as the U.S. government. So the spread is very, you know, very is tiny, um, but it can range to, you know, five, 10 percent for some very risky companies. Um, so that's the kind of range that, you, that you're looking at. Typically, the range is in is in the order of kind of one to two to three percent. And I think the point you make there is a really good point that bonds are seen as a very stable investment and they are often the more stable end of investing, but they're not stable. It's not a bank account. And so, you know, you say there, there are different factors that can send bonds up and down. What are some of those factors and how much of that volatility should people be expecting? So when a bond is traded, uh, if you hold that bond to maturity, you will get that money back. Right. So what you're concerned about is the path in the meantime. Right. If you need your money back and you want to sell those bonds before the maturity, then you can experience a mark to market gain or loss in the same way that you could buy a share low and then rallies you know, a few percent and you can sell it. You make a profit. You can do the same thing in bonds. So what's driving bond prices up and down? Well, the higher interest rates go, the lower bond prices go. Right. So there's an inverse relationship. Right. So um, because the bonds that have been issued, so, so, you know, three years ago, four years ago, interest rates were you know, close to zero. Bonds were offering very, very low yields, you know, one, two percent, three percent. And then so those bonds were trading on the market and then interest rates started to go up. So bonds, you know, the existing bonds that are trading, they're having to compete with new bonds that are being issued at higher interest rates. So in order to compete with those bonds, their prices have to fall such that when you buy those bonds on the market, the effective yield you're getting is comparable to a bond that will be issued on the same day, right? So that's a little bit of a complicated concept, but it means that bond prices go down when interest rates go up. So basically, as the interest rate goes up, fresh bonds that are issued will be a bit of a juicier prospect. Yep. And that means the ones that are existing and have that lower interest rate attached to them, a bit less enticing, fewer people want them, fewer people fighting over them, price yeah. goes down. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a very efficient market. So this happens on a daily basis. Right? It happens in real time. Mm. Yeah. How does that balance out for things like a lot of people like to invest in bonds through maybe an ETF, a fund structure? Mm. How does that all shake out? 
So if you're investing in an index of bonds, you get indices of bonds in the same way that you can get indices of shares, the New Zealand 50 index or the S&P 500 index. An index of bonds can um, diversify your risk. So you're not lending to one issuer, you are lending to a whole range of issuers that are in that index. It could be a government bond index, it could be a corporate bond index of certain you know, category in terms of risk. Um, and so all those bonds will be trading and because you're, you know, diversifying your credit exposure, what you're trading then is the, the macro drivers of those bonds, which is predominantly interest rates. And then for corporate bonds, the, the general um, perception of riskiness of corporate bonds vis-a-vis -vis government bonds at that point in time. So those will be driving the, the interest rates that you can get on a bond on a given day you know, to hold that bond to maturity, um, but that could be different from the previous day and therefore the prices are moving up and down. So those bond ETFs that invest in those indices are moving up and down in the same way that the bonds would. Right. And talk us through as well some of the ways that you make money from bonds, right? Because I think a lot of people understand with shares, you can hopefully sell it for a profit. If the company does well, more people want it, sell it for a profit, yay. Or things like dividends where you get a share of the profits. Mm. How does it work for bonds? So for bonds, you can make money in two ways. One, one is the yield you get, which is typically the coupon that's being paid. Um, so you know that because as a, you know, when you buy a particular bond, it will tell you what that coupon is and often they're paid every six months or they could be paid every um, three months or you know, every, every year. They're, they're different types of bonds that, that trade, but you know that. Um, and so you get paid that as a coupon. It's a bit like a dividend. You'll get it in, you know, in your bank account. Um, the other way, of course, is to, to take advantage of those price changes. Right? Um, and so when bond, bonds have fallen, you can look at that as an opportunity and you can say, well, actually, I think they've fallen reasonably you know, far and, and I think the outlook for bonds is improving, so I'm going to buy some of those. Uh, and then if interest rates, market perception of interest rates going forward goes down, then those bond prices can go up. You can sell and you can make a profit and you can, and you can sell that bond. Even if you haven't collected any coupons, you will sell the bond and you can make a profit. Mm, okay, and you mentioned previously about the, the term, the maturity, mm. and I think that's a really good one for us to nip into as well, because as you say, anything from 30 days to 100 years, you know, if you buy a bond as a 20 year old, I assume you're not planning to live to 120. How does all of that factor into your decision as an investor and, and what strategy you might take? Yeah, so I think it's worth visiting on the subject of you know why investors buy bonds and, and what utility they have in a diversified portfolio. Mm -hmm. So bonds typically are viewed as being lower risk than shares, right? So why would they be lower risk? Well, first of all, they are what's termed um, prioritized in the capital structure. So if you're lending to a company and the company goes bankrupt, the shares are first in line for capital that gets wiped out. And then any assets that get left over get divided up amongst the, the other um, investors in the company and bonds rank higher. So if a company does go bankrupt, then if you own the corporate bond in that company, there is a chance that you might get some of your money back. Right. So it is higher in the capital structure. So all else being equal, bonds should be lower risk than shares. Um, they are also um, tied to interest rates. Mm. So that tends to make them less volatile because they are anchored, right? And here's the thing, the longer dated the bond, the less they are anchored to where the interest rate is today, right? So we know the OCR is at 5.5% today. It doesn't move around every day, right? It's, it's OCR at 5.5% oh <laughs> five until the RBNZ sees fit to, to make a change. And, you know, if they have made a change, they've made a lot of changes in the last two years, you know, accumulated up to 5.5%, but that's only in, you know, increments of 0.5 or 0.25, right? But on a daily basis, interest rates at the 10-year point, so when you're lending to an entity for, you know, 30 days, 5.5 really matters, if you're lending at the 10-year point, what you're really thinking about is what's the perception of the market regarding interest rates over the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we know they're five and a half now. What could they be in six months? What could they be in three years? What could they be in eight years? And that will tell you your view on whether you think 10-year interest rates are attractive or not, right? So when you're investing in the term of those bonds, that, that's really important. So the interest rate at 10 years is not necessarily the same as the interest rate at today. Um, and so that and, and, and that's been a, a big part of the volatility of, sh uh, of bonds. Well, that's the thing, because we have seen, I mean, interest rates 
are often behind so much in the money world. They're mm. often the underlying force behind everything, but they very directly impact bonds. It's, it's quite a close relationship there. And we've seen interest rates doing some unexpected things in the last couple of years where they were, as you say, very, very, very low, unusually low, um, and then shot up again historically quickly. I mean, they were always going to go up but the speed at which they went up mm. caught many by surprise. Yeah. So when we've seen those sorts of changes over the last couple of years, what's been happening with the bond market? How has it handled this? <laughs> it's It's been a rough ride. Yeah. And in many ways, it's been the worst bond market ever, mm. right, in terms of the price moves that we've seen. So take ourselves back three years ago. We're in the depths of COVID. Interest rates, not just in New Zealand, but around the world, were pinned at zero, mm. even negative in places like Europe and Japan. Um, and everyone expected that to continue, mm. right, almost forever. Um, and, and so the bond market was pricing interest rates remaining at these very, very low levels. And then, of course, what happened, interest rates started going up. And not only did they go up, but they went up in a very quick fashion and they went up much further than many people, almost anybody had anticipated. At every single step along the way, interest rates, the hikes, the magnitude of hikes that we've seen from central banks is much greater than was priced in by the bond market, right? And so for bonds, that's terrible because, especially those long dated bonds, because your interest rate that you were you know, receiving three years ago, all of a sudden you've had to compete with interest rates now 5% higher and the price of those bonds have fallen. So to give you an example, there's a New Zealand government bond index. It just captures a range of bonds issued by the New Zealand government. Over the last three years, that's fallen close to 20%, right? That's substantial. That is. And then, so there's another um, popular ETF in the US called TLT, which is the 20-year the ETF. Right, so it's an ETF that invests into twenty-year bonds in in, in in you know in the U.S. That's fallen forty percent in the last three years. Also substantial. Right. So <laughs> when we talk about the GFC and we talk about the dot-com crash in the stock market, we're talking about you know falls in the stock market of orders of these magnitude, right? And yet we've seen these moves in bonds over the last three years that doesn't quite get so widely publicized, but it's been terrible. And also bear in mind, these are low risk investments, right? And so you've seen falls of 20 to 40% in bonds, which are typically very low risk. Mm. And that's why it's been a really tough environment for bonds. Yeah. And I think some people who maybe aren't um, in the investing world as deeply might have seen that in things like the conservative Kiwi Savers, yeah. where they fell quite unexpectedly um, and because they would have had investments like these right? because these yeah. were seen as more stable investments yeah. but any investment can be hit by something unexpected right and we are in hate to say it unprecedented times we would like some more precedented ones yes uh, well yeah, look yeah you may make a really good point conservative funds typically because bonds are low risk they normally comprise 80 percent mm. of conservative funds and so you've had this situation where, you know, the, the least risky asset has delivered you some really bad returns. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been a huge headwind. Right. You can, I mean, if you if you think about investing, you know, alternatives to debt will be a term deposit. Right. But two, three years ago, term deposits were offering you one or two percent. Right. For even for a year. And, and, and so, you know, it's not like the alternative was, was fantastic, um, but at least the term deposit didn't go down in price. Now, of course, if you hold those bonds, you know, if you held the bonds three years ago, two years ago, and continue to hold them for the next, you know, while until they mature, you'll make your money back, right? So any losses on those bonds will come back because it's unlikely the entities that you're lending to are going to go bankrupt. Um, so patience is required. And so now we've got term deposits offering 6%. And so a lot of people ask us, well, look, I can get 6% on a one-year term deposit. Why would I bother investing in a conservative fund that's delivered me negative returns over the last two or three years? And what you're looking at is forward-looking you know, term deposit returns versus what has, has happened in bonds over the last two or three years. So the real question we need to tackle is, what's the outlook for bonds? What are they going to do going forward? Exactly. Okay, so this is the kind of this is the fun bit for me as far as I'm concerned. Because, you know, we talk about this stuff and you say it's been a really, really bad bond market. Yeah, true. Um does this mean it's a good buying opportunity? 
Um, well, as always with any investment, as bonds have shown, there's risk that comes with them. Um, and there's mark to market risk clearly with bonds. So what we know that the driver of poor bond prices over the last three years were, the starting point was very low interest rates. We had very, very high inflation and the central bank needed to do something about it, right? So those were the three ingredients. And now we've arrived at a situation where inflation has come down. It's not quite gone away, but it's come down a long, long way from where it was, not just in New Zealand, but globally. Um, the central bank has done a lot of work already. They've got rates up to 5.5%, and it's not just in New Zealand. Australia's at 4.1%. You know, in the US, it's um, close to 5.5% as well. So they've done a lot of work already. And now central banks, if you listen to what they're saying, they're saying, we think we've done a lot. Maybe we have to hike one more time, but maybe we have to stay on pause. And the message now is higher for longer, which means that interest rates will stay up here for a longer period of time. But maybe plateaued. But yeah, exactly. And so the question now is, well, what's the bond market pricing for the path of interest rates? Mm. And what we saw at the beginning of this year was that the front end of the um, bond market, the, the short dated mar you know, market was pricing where exactly where the cash rate were, was, you know, where, where central banks set them. But the perception was that interest rates would fall very quickly. But now in the last six weeks, we've seen the repricing. And actually the bond market is now pricing something more akin to a higher for longer scenario. And so what matters for the price of bonds is not the level of interest rates, it's the change. All right. So do we think that the path of interest rates can continue to go higher from here? All right. Um, and if so, then potentially there is some further downside to the price in bonds. Um, but on the other side, and this is what we didn't have three years ago, we're now getting six, seven, eight, nine, ten percent yield as in every year you're earning that from the bond investments that you're making. So even if the price of bonds falls slightly from here, you can earn yield to compensate you on the other side. So it would be incredibly difficult to relive the last three years experience for the next three years. It was something, you know, something like Venezuela would have to happen in the rest of the world for that to, you know, for, for that to occur. So I think that's highly unlikely. So I'm not saying that bond prices can't go down further, but you're being compensated on the other side. So the outlook for bonds is looking a lot more attractive now. And the kicker is, if we get a weaker global economy, a weaker New Zealand economy, uh, which is what many are predicting, um, then the worst outcome for the economy gives you your best outcome for bonds. Ooh, interesting. This is often like what I say in news. I'm like, oh, this is terrible for people. Great for me. <laughs> <laughs> Keeps me busy. Um, okay, so that's really, really interesting. So when you're looking at all of this information and you are trying to figure out strategies for various funds, various clients, how is this impacting your strategy? So what we try and do is, is move around and change our exposures according to how we think things might move. Mm -hmm. So three years ago, we were nervous that interest rates were going to have to rise. When mm -hmm. um, we've got funds that are 80% bonds, you can't not hold bonds. <laughs> um, otherwise, you're just holding 100% cash, and that's not really what we're mandated to do. But we can change the risk profile. So what we did was we, we took exposure in shorter dated bonds that weren't going to be hit as hard in terms of negative price performance from higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. And we own, we didn't own government bonds, we owned corporate bonds that offered us an interest rate above that spread above and beyond government bonds. So we could own one, two, three year maturity corporate bonds that offered, you know, two, three, four percent above. So June of last year was when we really started to get excited about some of those corporate bonds, because we were getting seven, eight, nine, ten percent. All right, and now we're getting kind of, you know, there's been a bit of a cycle, but now we're starting to get some more um, opportunities like that where we're getting, yeah, 7, 8, 9, 10% on some of our corporate bonds. So, so we think the environment going forward is one way you can earn your way out of any market volatility, even if you don't get the price appreciation. If you get the price appreciation, well, look, that's icing on the cake. Um, but at least you can earn a decent return out of your bonds. All right, so... We've talked about the interest rate impact, huge. Um, also, obviously, if you're investing in corporate bonds, things like how stable do you think that business is? I mean, again, let's use the example of COVID because it's a, a quite extreme example that throws up some goodies. Um, you maybe wouldn't have been investing in tourism impacted businesses. Um, are those the main factors that impact bonds? Are there any others in the mix? 
Um, yeah, so I think it's an important point to, to note with regards, you know, the safety of this entity you're lending to. Uh, if we go into a recession, then bonds will perform well, but not all bonds. Because if you're lending to a company which is highly cyclical, um, which could be at risk from, you know, a recessionary environment, um, then there is potential risk of, of bankruptcies happening, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm not going to, you know, go into more detail on that, but bond bonds do carry risk. Mm. Um, so, you know, and typically the higher yield you get, the more risk the market perceives that that bond is carrying. Um, so, uh, you know, as you go into a recession, you can invest in safer bonds um, that might deliver you price upside if you get interest rate cuts, or you can invest in bonds that offer you a higher yield, but you've got to be wary that, you know, if we do get a bad recession, that companies start to, to go bankrupt and, you know, unable to pay back. Um, their bonds, then, then that could be an issue. Mm. And as you say, you know, every investment has risks that come with it. There are safer investments, but everything is impacted mm. by things that often we as investors just don't control, unfortunately. Um, so when you're putting together your investing strategy, we often say diversity is the name of the game, yep. don't put all your eggs in one basket. And Bonds can be a really good way to balance out some of the other investments yeah. you've got, right? How do you figure out its place in your portfolio, maybe what sort of percentage you're wanting to allocate to that and where you're at in your investing strategy? Um, so that's a great question. And, and, and really, we need to think about, you know, what bonds have done in the last 40, 50 years, mm -hmm. right? So the last time we had a big interest rate cycle, the 1980s, um, interest rates went up a lot because inflation was very high. Since 1980, early 1980s, when interest rates were close to 20% in the US, Bond, interest rates have come down and bonds have been great investments ever since. But not only that, is that you know, every time we've had a what's called a deflationary shock, so inflation hasn't been a thing for forever, you know, since the, since the you know, 80s or 90s, um, when we've had a deflationary shock, which is typically what we've had with the GFC, um, arguably dot-com boom was a bit of a deflationary shock as well, as in, you know, the problem was deflation, not inflation. Bond prices have gone up significantly. So you've had this ratchet effect where you've earned good returns on your coupons, on your yields, and then bonds have gone up every time there's been a shock to growth. If you own shares in your portfolio, growth shocks are not good, right? Because the outlook for profits deteriorates. So if you have recessionary environments like the GFC, then share prices go down. If you can have an asset like bonds that goes up in that same environment, then that's a really good diversifier, right? Unfortunately, the last three years, we've had a situation where bonds were just completely unable to provide that diversification benefit because the prices had already got as low as they, they, you know, they could practically go. But now we've had a situation where bond prices have risen further. If we get a deflationary shock, right, which could be, you know, something like another GFC, it could be another pandemic, um, then bonds will likely give you utility of diversification benefit i.e. your stocks will probably fall and your bond prices will will go up and so it will smooth out your returns which is why we have diversified portfolios which is why balance funds are typically 60 percent shares 40 percent bonds because that's the right mix historically that's delivered you the optimal return versus risk i.e. volatility that you experience Mm. And it is often about where you're at in that investing journey, right? But it can be a really good one. It's often what they talk about even as you um, head towards retirement, you would mm. up your bonds. But if you're at any sort of stage where you're looking for more income, I mean, this is, as you say, they're often referred to as fixed income. Mm. They can often be a really good one for that, right? Yeah, that's right. I would say you can invest in different types of bonds. So as you're approaching retirement, and you need, or you need the money sooner rather than later, and with anything, you know, you don't really want to be kind of investing in, in things if you need the money in less than three years' time. <laughs> um, but but typically, yeah, if you're in a lower risk fund, then you can invest in lower risk bond and still earn some pretty juicy returns yeah. just from the yield. Yeah. 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 Okay. Let's take the opportunity for some myth busting while we're here as okay. well. And I think you've touched on some, but let's dive into it properly. Are there any misconceptions out there about bonds that you think people should be aware of? Yeah, I think um, I think the key one to address really is is that price, the you know the daily traded price and the mark to market, right? So again, if you invest in a term deposit, you don't see the fluctuations in the price of that term deposit. You just earn your interest at the end. Right, a bond's the same thing. If you closed your eyes, invested in a bond today and closed your eyes, then you wouldn't see those mark-to-market movements, and you would get your 
money back at the end and you will get your yield, right? Unfortunately, as humans, we do look at the value of things every day. We look at our portfolios, are they going up and down? And we worry about those things. And typically when things go down, we have a tendency to want to offload those things and get out of them because we'd rather be in things that are going up, right? Um, and so I think, you know, being aware of the mechanisms that are driving that and thinking a bit more forward looking rather than, you know, being concerned with the experience you've had um, is, I think, is something that's really important to consider. So, yes, bonds have been terrible investments. There's no, you know, and there's no getting away from that. Um, but, you know, what's the outlook look like for bonds and, and how does that compare to alternatives? And I think the last couple of years have been rough for all sorts of investments. We've had very weird, unexpected forces impacting the markets. And this is why we saw, you know, when you were saying before about bonds are usually a good diversification, where if your shares go down, your bonds are probably fine. It was very unusual. And I remember there was so much chat from economists, from people in the market, about how unusual it was that everything went down Mm. at the same time. I mean, Mm. that literally hadn't happened for decades, had it? No, that's right. It hadn't happened. I mean, we, we have to remember that we had a period when everything went up yeah. um, for, you know, like I say, from the 1980s, effectively through to 2020. Mm-hmm. Stock prices really, you know, went up, but bond prices went up a lot as well. So we had enjoyed the spoils of that. And so it was a bit of a reset. So we're going through that reset. We've ha- arguably had, you know, the vast majority of the reset in bonds. Um, and so they are looking, you know, for your diversification now more attractive shares, you know, maybe a slightly different story. And another thing that people ask me about all the time is green bonds. I mean, mm. people love the idea of doing some good with their money at the same time as getting the spoils, right? So what are green bonds and do you get the same level of return with them? Is, is there any sort of price for doing the right thing? Yeah, that's a good question. So, yes, companies are, you know look to do the right thing and investors are obviously keen to invest in things that show that they're, they're you know, trying to help transition to you know, climate change, for example. Um, and so what a green bond is, is a company will issue a bond and they will say that the proceeds that they're getting for that bond, they're going to invest into renewable assets or, you know, um, assets that might benefit the, the environment in, in a certain way. So that's a pretty loose description. Um, these things are, you know, more about intent rather than kind of, you know, auditing it and make sure it, it, it really has been invested in that way. But uh, the investor is investing on that premise that we're giving the, the company. And, and some companies are green in nature. You know, a lot of our energy companies are renewable sources of, uh, you know, of energy. So when they issue bonds, it's very easy for them to issue green bonds because much of that goes into, you know, investing into new renewable assets. Um, there are other bonds which are a little bit more precise and they're called sustainability linked bonds right and and this is a bit more prescribed in that you're investing in a bond or you're lending money to a um, to a company and it's paying you an interest rate um, but it's also got a list of criteria that it's going to try and meet right and and there'll be various targets they've got and there could be climate change targets or you know carbon based you know carbon um, footprint targets or um, even things like governance you know in terms of you know board structure and things like that all these different targets if they don't meet those targets they'll pay the investor a bit of a bonus as in the company is incentivized to hit the targets, right? Are you almost as an investor hoping for them to be naughty? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. So, you know, if they're not naughty, then, you know, you're getting, you know, the kind of warm and fuzzy feeling that you've, you've driven positive change. And, and look, if they don't meet their targets, then, then they will pay you a bit of a bonus on top. So it's just, there's, there are other bonds called sustainability link bonds, which are a bit more precise in that they have a, a range of criteria which is sustainability linked. So there could be you know, green climate change, but it could also be governance, like the structure of the board. Um, and these are prescribed targets that the company has to try and meet. So the company will pay a rate of interest on the bond, same as any other bond. But if they don't meet those targets, they'll pay you a bonus. Right? They'll pay you a bonus to compensate you because you've invested in this bond on the kind of goodwill that they're going to try and meet those targets. And if they don't, then they're going to you know, compensate you um, for that. So, so these are bonds that do trade um, and you know, investors can invest in and typically you know, around the world. Um, and so there is, is something interesting. In terms of the price, there's not really that much price difference or, or, or yield difference between green and sustainability linked bonds and you know, regular bonds. Um, but what we have observed is that they tend to be slightly less volatile when, when, when bond markets are moving around. And, and that's possibly because they're more tightly held. If you're a, 
a sustainable investor, you're more likely to invest in that bond and hold it to maturity. You're not looking to trade in and out of it. You're investing in it for other reasons than just to get the yield. So interesting. Well, thank you so much for no, coming in, right. Mark. Well, that was good. great. Yeah. And chatting about everything bonds. So as always, do follow us for more chat about your money and understanding everything that's going on with it. You can find us everywhere. You find podcasts, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever else. Do leave us a five-star review. If it's a one-star review, no need to do it. Just walk away. Until next time, have a great day. Hey.